Okay, we're progressing well. Next heading, chapter twenty four. Now the focus is on inventory management. Okay, a little bit different. So big heading again, chapter 24, inventory management. Short chapter, you can see there's only three outcomes here. Learning outcome one says, understand why businesses hold stock, which is inventory, and the cost of stock holding. And then number two, analyze the advantages and disadvantages of traditional stock management systems. And the last one, discuss the just-in-time um, stock management system. Those are the two or three things we need to look at. It's very short. Not a lot of content to cover here. Okay. <laughs> Introduction. What is inventory? Let's start there. That's going to be used for for sales, do you agree? Yeah. Okay, so that's the important bits. Merchandise slash goods slash stock available for resale. Mer Merchandise, okay. So that's what we're dealing with here. And then obviously we're going to be looking at the management of the stock. So how do we control and manage the stock that's going to be sold? Right, so all businesses hold inventory of some kind. They say banks and insurance companies will hold supplies of stationery, and retailers will have goods on display in their warehouses. Manufacturing businesses will hold inventory in very distinct forms. Raw materials and components, work in progress, or finished goods. So do you agree, inventory is anything that's meant to be held for resale, or held as part of the business's um, operations day to day? Yeah. Okay, so they've actually used stationery here as a form of inventory. When is stationery an asset? Um, when it's not being used. So if, if stationery is sitting in the um, storeroom and we haven't used it, Remember that adjustment that you provide for? Yeah. It's a inventory on hand adjustment. Remember that. Okay, so from accounting, any um, stationery that isn't used during the year will be will be held on hand and it will be used the next year. Um, so when focusing on something like stationery, it isn't an asset, it's an expense. But we consider it an asset when we have supplies of it yeah. that are waiting to be used. Um, just put a note here, forms of inventory. Forms of inventory. Yeah, well, I just said um, anything available for sale, that's all. And so if we're buying goods to sell, then those goods would be considered inventory stock. Forms of inventory, there's a few here actually. Looking at this whole idea of manufacturing, as well as what we just said, inventory um, in terms of stationery.
Right, so the first one, I'm just going to put a note here. Number one, asterisk, inventory on hand, brackets, accounting, adjustments, e.g. stationary on hand. Okay, the textbook spoke about stationary. on hand and that's a form of inventory on hand right, so that's the first form then we can look at the others which relate to manufacturing so second form raw materials in brackets used for production slash manufacturing e.g. Wood for furniture. That's one example. Inventory of hand or on hand? Um, on, sorry, typo. Yeah, so that's the one form. Uh, the text was work about holding supplies of stationery. So if I'm keeping stationery on hand that I haven't used, we would consider it inventory. Okay, that's an accounting adjustment. Then the textbook spoke about the um, details in terms of production, okay, details relating to the um, creating of products and finished goods. Raw materials could be one. Yeah, so if something is a raw material, it hasn't been processed yet. The wood that we would use to create the furniture would be considered part of the raw materials that would be needed in order to produce it. Is that okay? Not this you. Not you. Not you. Raw materials. This is a short chapter here. Only eight pages. I see a little bit of maths though. Well, graphs, not really maths. They give you the formulas. No, they don't. Okay, so it doesn't look like you have to do the calculations for this section. There are calculations there, but not ones that you need to worry about. Okay. Okay, <laughs> second one, work in progress. If something is a work in progress, what does that mean? It's not finished yet. Exactly. So here they said, at any one time, the production process will be converting raw materials into components of finished products. During the process, there will be work in progress for these firms, such as the building of or construction of businesses. This will be the main form of inventory held. Um, the value of work in progress depends not only on the length of time needed to complete production, but also the method of production used. Example, batch production. Can we talk about batch yeah. processing versus... Uh, uh, line, batch, line, and job. Remember yeah. that. Okay, that was what we spoke about last time in terms of the actual physical uh, production of these goods. Okay, so what did we write here? Okay, we just wrote work in progress. Let's write this down. Number three, WIP work in progress. Brackets. WIP. What is work in progress? Well, we're looking at the whole idea of producing something that is finished from something that was raw in terms of materials. So, work in progress would be taking input and converting it to output.
the WIP is the uh, I want to say is the product in development or in production. It says the good in production. Brackets partly manufactured, not complete yet. That's the key. Okay, so it's anything that's still going to have to be finished. As you said, it's incomplete. But right, goods that are not finished have to be manufactured completely. So they might have to be, uh, maybe the furniture might, be, have to, might have to be painted. Um, so the items of furniture that haven't been painted could be considered work in progress. Right? Or maybe haven't been assembled. You might have chairs and tables that haven't been assembled correctly yet. That'll fall under this heading, work in progress. And then the last one, which is the easy one, finished products, or finished goods. Well, that'll be items available or items ready for resale, ready for sale. 100% complete. That's what you're looking at there in terms of finished products. Are all of those items inventory? Yes. So what is this looking at? It's looking at the different forms of inventory. Inventory just isn't inventory. Inventory could be work in progress, inventory could be inventory on hand, inventory could be finished goods or even raw materials. Right, so can you give me an example of the three different categories? So uh, I used furniture, can you use something different? Um, for the three? Yes. Um, what example can you use to describe those three forms of inventory relating to manufacturing? Um, I suppose cake won't really be... Uh, yeah, that can work. So the raw materials like the egg and stuff? Okay, yes. So raw materials would be the ingredients that go into making the cake. Yeah. Fine. Then what working, would the work in progress be? Progress would be like the, the stuff that needs to set in the fridge and then you still need to do stuff. Okay, yeah. So the work in progress could maybe be the, um, the, the cake that comes out of the oven yeah. before the decoration and icing and cream and um, other stuff that goes into it. So the, the, the filling, basically. Okay, so we just have, we've just baked those cakes um, in terms of the, the sponge or that part of the cake and they still need to put on all the extra stuff to make it nice and edible. Okay, so finished goods would be the final product. Okay, the last, 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 last step. Mm -hmm. Right, that covers the first part in terms of different types of inventory. Now we're going to be looking at the management of inventory. So there's just a short little category or topic here or heading. Um, and this subcategory here just looks at the effective ways of managing inventory. They say, why do inventory, um, why does inventory need to be managed effectively? Why do you think it needs to be managed effectively? Because it can be a loss to the business. Correct. Okay, so let's say we're buying dairy products, milk, yogurt, ice cream. More or less difficult to manage. Th why? Because it can expire. Correct, it can expire and those items need to be cooled. Okay, you can't um, transport ice cream without having some form of um, cooling system. So like the, the actual like truck that is going to transport the ice cream needs to have like those refrigeration capabilities. Okay, that's something to consider here because obviously firms don't want to suffer losses. Yeah. So there's a few things they've discussed here in terms of why inventory management is important. So let's put a note here. Reasons for having good inventory management systems.
Right, so as you said, it's important um, to keep an eye on the inventory that we've got in the business because we need to make sure that we have inventory that we can sell. So the example that we used here was dairy products. If I'm going to be selling milk and I'm buying lots of milk from the farm, that milk is going to go off if I don't keep it chilled. Right, and we don't want lots of milk that's now gone sour. Okay, that's very, very bad. So the first one that we can mention here, which is actually bullet number three, they talk about wastage and incorrect storage conditions. So we know milk has to be stored in the refrigerator. Um, other things, uh, things that can't be wet. So for example, cereal. If you're studying cereal, um, you can't have that get wet. Okay, it's still exposed to moisture. Okay, the moisture is going to make that stuff go bad. Right, so some things need to stay dry. Some things need to be refrigerated. Some things might have to be kept hot. Okay, so um, let's think of something that would have to be warm. Um, if I'm selling pies, I'm selling food, I can't sell someone food that's cold. I need to sell food that's hot. So if we're selling pies and we're going around um, selling these, these items, um, again, the storage conditions need to be appropriate. Okay, it's almost like those little, um, you've probably seen those like food stands. Like sometimes when you go to those um, like expos and things like that, um, they have these little food stands. And those food stands have something that keeps the food warm. Okay, it's normally gas, and then they use that to, to keep the, the stuff hot. Okay. Right, so first thing, reducing wastage. That's the first point in terms of why we should have a good management system. Okay, we don't want to waste it. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, five. Okay, but they're, they're just short. Um, I'm just taking out the key points. So point number three was talking about the wastage um, and the storage and making sure conditions are right to avoid mishandling and so on. Okay, even maybe the mishandling we can discuss. So wastage could be, let's say I'm transporting glass, okay, wine glasses. Very delicate. Right, if those wine glasses break or crack or get destroyed, problem. Do you agree? That's a reason for having good inventory management systems. Reduce the wastage. Okay, I can't have all these glasses moving in the car and then they all break. And now we've got nothing. Okay, we've wasted that. All right, the second bit, um, unforeseen changes in demand. So reason for having good inventory management systems, um, I'm going to say analyzing demand. So are we going to buy lots and lots and lots of um, old cell phones, maybe, just use that. No. Okay, would we want to stock a lot of these old cell phones? No. Okay, you would want to stock what people are demanding. Okay, so you would buy more of the newer phones rather than the older phones if you're selling cell phones. Right, so if, if I'm stocking inventory, so if I'm going to the supplier, if I'm going to Apple, if I'm going to Samsung, if I'm going to um, Sony, if I'm going to Nokia, if I'm going to um, what other, what other ones do you need? LG, okay? Um, what am I going to be doing? I'm going to be buying the models of phones that sell, okay, that I know will be in demand. But there's no point buying stock that no one wants. Okay, and that's something to consider. That's the next one. Another bullet. Very high inventory levels may result in excess storage. So, storage capacity may be limited. Right, so if I've only got one storeroom, am I going to buy stock that's, that's, um, that's too much, that I can't fit no. in that storeroom? No, that's bad. See, another reason for having good management systems. But what happens now if you if you buy too much and now you can't store it? Where what, what are you going to have to do? You're going to have to pay for more space. You're going to have to rent more space, and that obviously adds more costs to the business if you weren't wanting to hold so much stock. Another thing is fast changing technological products uh, need to be appropriate in terms of their rotation system. Um, they talk about fresh foods um, and technology. So what happens when new food comes out? 
or comes in actually. The old food goes out. So that's the, if they call it out of date, <coughs> it would be expiry. Okay. Yeah. Expiry dates. Expiry dates slash fast changing or fast moving items. Fast changing items. But also, the reason why we need to manage inventory. So, for example, um, the retail stores. Okay, so if we walk across the road and we go to uh, Woolies or Checkers. Can the store sell us items that have expired? No, that'll be a very, very, very big problem if, if, they, if there is expired items in the store. Okay, the store would actually get into trouble. Right, so they need to manage inventory correctly. And that's what this is looking at. So this is looking at expiry dates, fast changing items. Right, bring out the new item, uh, bring out the latest item. Okay, that's what you're looking at. Right, and the last point, Poor management of supplies can result in late deliveries. So that's affecting the customer's satisfaction. So reasons for having poor inventory management system, customer satisfaction. In brackets, we can talk about the delivery. Okay, that was one thing they mentioned here. They just said poor management and supply of inventory uh, due to late deliveries, low discounts, um, and also this is, so when, when looking at customer satisfaction, that's looking at the customer, we could also look at the supplier. If we're not paying our supplier on time, are we going to get the inventory that we want? No. Right, so supplier in brackets here, I'm just going to say relationship management. Or relationship, I think that's good enough. I'm going to fit that word in. Okay, so here I'm looking at the relationship between you and the supplier. Will we have a relationship with our supplier? Yeah. Yes, you yeah. will. And are we going to have good credit terms? Well, that would depend on the relationship between you and your supplier. Mm -hmm. If you're a good customer to your supplier, would your supplier give you more credits? Probably. Right, so they might give you 60 days to pay or 90 days to pay if you're a reliable customer. If you're not, then they're going to have to review and shorten that period, depending. Okay. All right, so that covers that part. New heading now. We're looking at costs. How many costs? Two. And then they look at the optimal inventory management decision making. Okay, so let's put a heading. Inventory management costs. And let's list them. Okay, so we've already looked at one. We said, if I'm buying and selling stock, am I going to have to store the stock? Yeah. Yes. So what would that be considered as? A storage cost. Okay, so something simple. Storage. So now give me different storage costs that you could have. So we know storage costs involve payments that we make because we have stock on hand. So what are some examples of storage costs that we could have to incur? Can you but think you of examples? Get one type of storage cost. No, you get quite a few. That's the into a warehouse. Okay, that's one. So space. Bracket rent. Okay, that's a storage cost. What else could be a storage cost? Mm -hmm. Security. Don't we need to protect the sto the, oh, yeah. the, um, the stock? Yeah. So let me ask you this. If you've got hundreds of items of cell phones. Okay, and those cell phones are all the latest models, right? So high-end devices, um, tablets, laptops, computers. Are you just going to leave that in a warehouse that doesn't have security? 
Definitely not. You would be very, very worried about your stock because th that could be very expensive. Right, and if someone takes that stock, that's a loss to the business. So security would be a storage cost. What else? What are the costs that we have for storing stock? Just think about different types of stock. We spoke about food. How are we going to store that? Fridges. Yes, that's another cost. <coughs> Refrigeration. Another important cost to consider. Okay, the textbook says um, special conditions like refrigeration, uh, they talk about security guards, um, they talk about fire and flood. Okay, so that could be what? Um, that's, a, that's an interesting one. Um, protection against like natural disasters. So like, um, yes, that's a good way. That's a good cost to look at. Nice, well done. Insurance is a good cost to incur. Right, so if I have a um, fire at the business premise and all the stock gets destroyed by the fire, hopefully the insurance would have paid for those damages. Okay, that's very good. Right, two. Opportunity costs. This comes from economics. What does it mean? Do you remember? An opportunity cost. No. Something that you forego, remember? Yeah. Something that you lose out on. Okay. I'm just trying to think of how to summarize what they've given you here. Okay, they talk about, okay, two things here. The example they've got is, do we buy new equipment, okay, um, or do we keep the capital in the bank? If I'm keeping capital in the bank, what will I be earning? Interest. Interest, good. If I choose to buy equipment to manufacture goods, what are we going to do? We're going to get inventory. Right, so the opportunity cost is going to be the decision making. So decision making, decision making affecting the production. E.g., do we buy another machine or do we keep the capital in the bank. That's the question mark. Right, so the opportunity cost is weighing up the pros and the cons. I'm looking at inventory management here. So these are costs that I'm going to have to incur. So the opportunity cost would be losing out on something. Okay, if I buy a new machine, do you agree we might be able to produce more and that might reduce certain costs? So there would be a benefit for doing that. But there could also be a disadvantage because then we would have lost out on the, in, uh, the interest that we would have had in the bank had we not spent that money. Right, so that's what the textbook talks about here. Um, three, holding costs. Uh, well, these are storage costs. Storage costs are actually holding costs. I'm just going to add that here. Storage costs slash holding costs. And then wastage. Wastage slash obsolescence. Obsolescence. Okay, obsolescence means when something goes old and it becomes outdated. That's another cost that we would have to possibly incur.
Right, the textbook also say cost of not holding enough inventory. Um, does this does the existence of this holding cost mean that firms should carry as few inventory as possible? Question mark. What do you think? Should a firm hold the minimal stock that they require? Yeah. Then what are you thinking? Why do you say that? Because it can waste. Okay, but what happens if you have um, customers that just come to the store and there's so many and they all want the same product and you don't have enough? Yeah. What is that going to do? You lose out on profit, on sales. Yeah. Right, so as a business, you need to weigh up the pros and the cons. Are we going to hold a little bit more or a little bit less? So if wastage is a consideration, you'd probably hold a little bit less. less. But if profit is the consideration, you'd probably hold a little bit more. Because yeah. what happens if more people want to buy those items? Does that make sense? Okay, so let's write a note about that. Asterisk, it's a separate consideration here. They said the cost of not holding enough inventory. The cost of not holding enough inventory. Um, it's just a separate consideration for the whole total cost thing. Okay, so uh, we had a heading here, inventory management costs. So if I'm looking at the cost associated with managing inventory, I need to look at the cost of not holding enough inventory. And what is that? That's the missed opportunities. Brackets, customers, wanting stock, and not having any. Okay, on the next page, they even talk about that. They say, lost sales. They talk about idle production resources. Okay, so there's two things. I'm either going to have too much, or I'm going to have too little. If I have too little, I'll have lost sales. There's the first one. Let's put a note by that. Lost sales when holding too little. The second one, they talk about idle production resources. Okay, so buying too much and having idle resources. Buying too much, I'm just going to say dot dot dot, idle resources. Uh, they went with special orders could be expensive and small order quantities could be more pricey as well in terms of placing an order. So do you agree, if I'm not holding enough inventory, am I going to have to buy more at some point in time? Mm -hmm. Yes, I will. So now here's the big debate. So for example, let's use um, stationery for, for a minute just to discuss it. So now you're using all those different colored um, coaches to help make your, <coughs> your summaries. So now let's assume that you haven't bought a pack of those cookie pens and you just bought one. If you only buy one, are you going to be able to buy more later on? Yes, you will. But now if you keep buying one and one and one and one and one, is it cheaper or more expensive to buy singles? More expensive. Exactly. It's more expensive to buy single items of stationery rather than a pack. Right? And that's what they're trying to discuss here. So they're saying, if I'm going to place a special order, a special order means something additional, meaning I've got X amount of pens and I'm going to place an order for a few more. Um, should I have uh, spent money on all the pens? Probably. Yeah. Yeah. So I should have maybe just bought all the pens that I was going to need. Yeah. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Right, so uh, it's, it's kind of like, it's like buying more now and then holding on to it for later or buying less now and then having to buy more later. But if I have if, if I have to buy more later, it's gonna be more expensive because now you're buying separate instead of that whole order, the big order. Okay, got that. Yeah. All right, so <laughs> let's summarize that point. 
special orders when stock or more stock is needed when more stock is needed brackets will be expensive um, let's say yeah let's just say that will be more expensive and that's a special order and special means you've placed it in addition to what you're normally ordering and then the last point here is looking at smaller quantities. So another note here in terms of the cost of not holding enough inventory. If small quantities are held, how many orders do you think you're going to have to place? Exactly. Okay, so if I'm, if I'm only buying smaller quantities, so for example, if I buy bulk, I only need to place one order. Yeah. If I buy small, I might have to place two, three, four, five, six different orders. And that's what they're looking at here. So if small quantities are held, more orders will be placed. More orders will have to be uh, will have, have to be placed. And there could be a cost for placing your order. That's a potential consideration. Does that make sense? Yeah. Perfect. Right, new topic. There's a few graphs here. Um, I see they don't ask you about the measurement in terms of calculation. So they talk about this EOQ, uh, but they don't say that you need to calculate it. So it's probably beyond the scope of what you currently have to do right now. I don't see any formulas anywhere. Yeah, there's nothing. But so uh, these diagrams are very, very, very useful because they teach understanding. Yeah. Okay, so let's summarize what we've got there. I'm going to put a note here. Inventory management system diagrams uh, or graphs. Graph slash diagrams. In brackets, asterisks, see page 368. Right, so what is the first diagram showing us? Explain what the diagram is showing in terms of information. What can you see there? Yeah. Okay, they've labeled the diagram, so tell me what you got there. That's your stock holding costs. Okay, well, stock holding uh, where's the stock holding costs? Yeah. And it's sloping up or down? Up. up. So let's understand what that means. Why is the graph sloping up? Because the costs are increasing. When what happens? Look at the y-axis, look at the x-axis. When costs increase. Well, the cost will be more when? When quantity increases. Correct. So does that make sense? So what is that line representing? The holding cost when I buy more? Stock. stock. So let's write that down. What happens to holding cost when I buy more stock? Increases. Correct. There's the answer. Okay, so holding costs. Uh, yeah, we'll discuss what that is just now. We first need to understand what the picture is saying. Um, graphs, inventory management system graph slash diagrams, page three sixty eight. That's the graph stuff. Okay, because you looking at your textbook here, you don't have to do the calculations. Okay, so that helps quite a bit because the calculations are quite um, quite long and there are formulas for it. Okay, like EOQ is the square root. Um, with the holding cost, ordering costs, and so on. Uh, but you don't have to do that, so you don't have to worry about it. I'm just looking at the content that you have in your book, um, and you do have the graphs. So you're probably going to have to interpret the graphs or read from the graphs. Okay. Okay, so what did we say about the holding costs? We just spoke about it. If it, the whole part increases in quantity increases. Correct. So it's logical, right? If I buy more stationery, I'm going to need more pencil bags to store it. It's logical. And if I need more pencil bags, that has increased the holding costs. Because now before I needed one, I'm going to need two, three, four, five. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's write that down. Summarize it. Holding costs increase.
when more stock is bought. It's logical. Right, what are the costs you see in the diagram? So you get 24.1. So now we've looked at the one diagram, which is the one sloping up, okay, the graph sloping up, holding costs increase when more stock is bought. Right, the more I buy, the more storage I'm going to need. Okay, next. What's the line sloping down? Out of stock costs. Okay. okay, so out of stock costs. Out of stock meaning I don't need to hold no, on to the stock. Yeah, so it's something that's looking at the ordering. So what happens to your ordering costs if I buy bigger quantities? Decreases. They decrease, correct. So if I buy one item, very expensive. If I buy bulk, very cheap. Make sense? Okay, summarize that. Ordering costs decrease when we buy more stock. Just going to put an asterisk here. Bulk buying. That's ordering costs. And that's why we've got, we've got that sloping down. Right, they call that out of stock costs. Okay, it's a it's a very strange way of describing ordering costs. Right? But it, they might be using um, the word out of stock costs because it's broader. Okay, they're looking at other considerations as well, not just the ordering of the stock. It could be other related um, items as well. Right, for example, transport. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> if you're transporting one good, very expensive. Right, because it's like the car has to travel with one item. Okay, but now if I buy 10, 20, 30 items, I'm transporting all the same items but using the same mode of transportation. Same cost. Exactly, same cost but for more items. Right, what, what's the last graph that you see there on the picture? This. That one. And what is that graph representing? Nothing. Total cost. Just read the labels. Yeah, but what's optimum? Optimum means? The best. Okay, optimal, optimal or optimum is the best. Okay, the most effective. The uh, yeah, the best is the right way of describing it. All right, so let's write that down. Total cost equal holding plus carrying. Total cost equal holding and carrying. Brackets asterisks businesses should try operate at the optimal level of um, okay we don't we haven't discussed what EOQ is yet so you won't actually know what that is I'm just going to leave it as that optimal level full stop okay we can discuss what EOQ is then you'll know what that means Okay, so total cost is holding plus carrying. For what? <coughs> For this. So if I'm dealing with inventory, there are always two costs to consider. The cost of holding it. Uh, ooh, hold on. Holding and carrying are the same. That's a mistake. Ordering. That's better. Sorry, I made a mistake when I wrote down the two costs. Yeah, it's ordering and holding costs. Okay, yeah, we mentioned the the price the price of placing bigger orders, are they cheaper or more expensive? Expensive. Uh, cheaper to, to order more yeah. stock. Okay, <coughs> so that's again ordering costs. Yeah. Holding costs would be the cost of storing. Slightly different. Yeah. Okay, you've got that. Yeah. Perfect. New heading, economic order quantity, EOQ, economic order quantity, and next to it you can put the word here, <coughs> optimal, <coughs> optimal order size, that's what it does. Okay, so the purpose of EOQ is to give you the optimal, i.e. the best, the best possible amount or size. 
that's what it does. Okay, so you're lucky that you're not having to do the mathematics, okay, because it does get more complicated than this, but you're just looking at the decision making around this. So EOQ represents economic order quantity. If something is economic, what does that mean? We're making the most of something. Right, so um, to work economically, right, it's to work um, without wasting too much. Does that make sense? Right, so what do you think this is going to mean in terms of inventory? Okay, how would we have an economic order? Okay, you're minimizing the total holding and ordering costs. Keeping costs as low as possible. Okay, I actually want to draw a diagram to show you what I mean by this. Okay, so we have a diagram here, but that's a picture. Um, it's not a table or a, like an actual, um, uh, uh, what's the right way of describing is this, it? Is this the definition of a short time? Well, economic order qu uh, quantity is looking at um, getting the minimum total holding and ordering costs. Yeah, so you can write this definition if you want to. Here they said the optimal or least cost quantity of stock to reorder um, taking into consideration the cost of the stock or um, holding costs and that's their definition. Okay, my definition is just minimizing the cost. That's what that's what you're actually doing. Because look at the graph. Look, uh, is this a parabola? Yes. What is that EOQ point called? The turning point. Is that point the lowest point on the graph? Yes. It's the lowest point on the graph. Got that? Minimizing, yeah. Minimizing the total holding and ordering costs. Keeping costs as low as possible. But, and from a business point of view, is that good? Very good. Okay, businesses need to keep costs lower right, and try to maximize the benefits. And that's what you're trying to do here. So the reason why I want to show you a diagram is because it actually makes sense. So let me do this on the next page. EOQ Okay, what I'm going to show you here is a diagram relating to the uh, or let's use a table. A table might actually be easier than drawing a diagram. Let's do that instead. Okay, so I'm looking at two things. Quantity, holding, ordering.
Okay, so what is going to happen to quantity? Obviously, we're going to buy more. So 1, 10, 100, 1,000. Uh, that's not right. There. 1, 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000, 100,000, 1 million. Okay, so tell me about the ordering cost. What's going to happen to it? Up or down? Correct. So we're going to start off with low and we're going to end high. Okay, that's for holding costs. Yeah. Right, so what type of relationship do we have here? Direct or indirect? I don't know. Direct. Okay, direct is when the graph slopes upwards, meaning if the one increases, the other increases. So is supply direct or indirect? It's direct. Okay, because supply, the supply graph slopes up. Okay, meaning when quantity goes up, so does the price. Okay, because that's supply and demand. The graph slopes that direction. Okay, if you have a graph that slopes down, so let me ask about ordering costs. If I order one unit versus I order a million units, in terms of the order cost, yes. it would be less okay, per unit. So here you would have high and then you would have low there. So now where would the EOQ be? If the one goes up and the one goes down, so one goes up, one goes down, where's the EOQ? Mm -hmm. Exactly. There's the key. Right, so this point, somewhere in the middle, will, I'm just going to use that. Inter, uh, no, not intersect. Yeah, intersect is right. Intersect is where they cross. Intersect. The um, this point is called the EOQ. That's what you've got. Okay. Right. So we're going to say, well, if I'm going to have EOQ. At some point in time, EOQ is going to be the point where those two graphs intersect. This could be the EOQ, right? Because holding costs go up and they get very, 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 very expensive. Ordering costs come down and they get very, very, very cheap. And at some point, it's going to be optimal. See, because see this graph goes down and then it goes up. Right, so the optimal level is where we have the lowest possible total cost. That's what we're looking at. So at this point, so EOQ will be somewhere in the middle. And that would have reduced all our costs. That's the key. Okay, just put a note here. Brackets, asterisk, uh, minimal costs. Or minimal total costs. Let's use the word total because it's both. And that's why we do it. So the only reason why you would have to calculate EOQ is to try to find the place where those costs are Minimal or minimized. Right, um, see page 368 again, just in terms of the diagram. Okay, so I'm just adding a table to explain it. So you can see quantity, you can see holding, you can see ordering somewhere in the middle, it's going to be the same. There's the point on the graph. Okay. Right, next topic controlling inventory levels. Let's see, controlling inventory levels. Controlling inventory levels. 
Okay, that's the focus here. Right, so so far we've looked at holding and ordering cross degree. What do we still need to look at? Controlling. Yes, so now what does the controlling involve? So let me ask you this. When looking at stock, there's two things that I need to consider. The order cost and the holding cost, we agree. And those costs will affect the amount of stock that I'm going to be holding within the business. Second thing is, how do I control the stock that I have? Yeah. So what does that deal with? How does this differ to what we just discussed? The control is... Um, is the when, the timing. Okay. okay, so now, do you agree? What did EOQ tell us? It's in the middle. The amount that we must order. There's the EOQ. Maybe I should highlight this, actually, so you can see it. Okay, what does EOQ actually tell us? The How big exactly? There you go, you've got it. Okay, so in asterisks here, how much to order? That's what EOQ answers in terms of the question. So if you want to know what EOQ does, it gives you an amount of stock that you have to order that's going to reduce your holding and your ordering costs. That's what it does. Make sense? Yeah. This is not looking at how much do we order. This is looking at the controlling of the stock levels. So if I'm controlling stock levels, I'm looking at timing. So now you know how much to order. How much do I order? EOQ. The problem is when do I place an order? Does that make sense? Yeah. That's the next part. So put a heading, reorder points or subheading, number one. Reorder points. Okay, what does the reorder point look at? This is the time at which we need to order slash buy more stock. Dot, 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 dot. That's what we're looking at. Right, so a reorder point is the, is the, um, it's the timing. Okay, it's the when. Let's write that down. When do we buy more? That's what this is looking at. Okay, so both go hand in hand. You need both in so order to run. This is under controlling. Yeah, this is under controlling. This is a way to control your stock. It's by determining when to buy more stock. Okay. Okay, so maybe write down the definition that they've given you here for reorder shorts. The number of units, uh, no, this is reorder quantity, wrong one. Where's reorder points? Uh, reorder quantity. Okay, they talked about buffering. Uh, reorder stock levels. Just in time. Okay, so then, then they should talk about the points. Um, but this is the, the quantity related to how much you buy at the time of the order and the lead time. So we'll I'll put all of that together in one in one summary then. Okay, the reorder point also looks at the lead time. Okay, got that. Alright, so let me summarize what they've given you here then. They said, a graphical approach in terms of this whole idea of controlling inventory. Um, there's a few things they mentioned here. Buffer inventory, lead time, and reorder stock levels. Okay, so A. Um, so is this under reorder? Yes. A. Buffer inventory. Okay, buffering means like, uh, loading. yes, loading in a way, correct, yeah, like technology. So if you have a very slow internet connection, um, the video tends to buffer. So it loads a little bit more ahead so that yeah. it doesn't stop and start and stop and start and stop and start. Okay, that's buffering. 
So when looking at buffer inventory, that's exactly what you're looking at. You're not looking at, well, I have no stock and I have to wait, and then I have to get stock, and then I have to wait, and then I have to get stock, and then I have to wait. That's bad. Okay, so buffering buffer inventory is having a little bit more to use slash sell while we wait for the new stock to arrive. That's what you're looking at. Okay, so that's what buffer stock is or buffer inventory. It's having a little bit more on hand. So for example, you've got lots of stationery, right? Okay, you've always got extra pens and pencils. Why? Because if one runs out, I still have a spare. And that's what you're looking at here. That's what the buffer inventory is. Yeah. Right. So let's not have no stock on hand. Because if there's no stock on hand, can consumers buy? No, they can't. So a company that's selling stock needs to have stock on hand. They can't have too much because that's going to make the holding cost very high. But at the same time, they can't have too little or none. Because if they do, then the sales are affected. Okay, that's the theory we spoke about at the beginning of the chapter. Right, right now we're looking at the measurement of it. Okay, so how do I measure how much do I require? You need to look at the reorder stock levels. Okay, so B, reorder stock level. Okay, what is this? This is the time at which we place and order. Right, so let me use the pen and pencil scenario. Let's assume that one pen that you have lasts you two weeks. Okay, so writing consistently with one pen lasts you for two weeks. Right, if it takes three weeks for a pen to be delivered, okay, let's see these are special pens that come from overseas. Right, and it takes two weeks for you to get the pen. Okay, so if, if, you're gonna, if you're going to be using a pen, one pen lasts you for two weeks, and it takes two weeks for a new pen to be delivered, how much spare pen would you need? One. Correct. Okay, you would always have to have one extra pen. Why? To provide for the lead time or the order time, um, the, the distribution, okay, the logistics. And that's what the next point is looking at. So, lead time. time it takes to deliver new stock. That's lead time. Lead time is how long do I have to wait before I get the next batch of goods? So do you agree, if I'm going to wait a very long time, am I going to need more or less buffer inventory? No. I'm going to need more. And in terms of my reorder stock level, would my reorder stock level be higher or lower? No. Uh, it would be higher. Because you would have to have more stock before you order, do you agree? Yeah. So let's say the stock is sitting at 100. If it drops to 50, let's place an order. Okay, you would have to place an order sooner, not later, if the lead time was longer, not shorter. Is that okay? Perfect. Right, so having said that, can you describe this diagram to me? There's an example there of a, a company's, um, in terms of an order and, and, and holding, and uh, details relating to the stock levels, um, what is that describing? What? The yeah. graph? Yeah. I don't know. What do you mean? Describe what you see. Uh, read the labels. It's very confusing. Read the labels. Try and make sense of the diagram as much as possible. What what uh what are the axes representing? The units and the weeks. Good. Okay, the reason why I'm doing this as well is because what I've seen in your past papers is they do give you application questions. So they give you data and information, and then you've got to read and interpret that. So if they give you this graph, could you explain it to them? 
You see, that's the, that's the challenge. <clears throat> yeah. right. It's easy to study theory and just repeat it. But now what happens if they give you a diagram of this? Okay, so now you should be able to describe this to me now, right? Mm -hmm. Quick description. Three things. Describes the holding cost, out of sale cost, and the optimal cost. Yeah, so what does the holding cost do? Explain it. Increases. When? When quantity do increases. Good. So the holding costs increase when quantity increases. Perfect. What else? Then out of, out of stock decreases. Good. So this decreases as quantity increases. Yeah. Great. And what does this graph represent? The stuff you spread to order. The total. Yeah. The total. Right. So this graph plus that graph gives you the total. Okay. So that's what you're looking at. So now I want you to do the same thing but for that one. So first look at the axes. What do you have on the x-axis? Weeks. Time. In weeks. What do you have on the y-axis? Units. Good. So you've got time, which is that way, and you've got units, which is this way. Um, and then the graph has labels. So what labels do you have? Maximum inventory labels. Perfect. Okay, so, so what would the maximum inventory level be? Maximum means? The most. Okay, so how much stock does this business hold at max? 60. 60 units. See, that's what we're describing. Right, so in this particular business, does this business hold more than 60 goods? No, they don't. The no. maximum stock that they ever hold 60. is 60 goods. Does that make sense? Okay, what else do you know about this business? What is their buffer inventory? 10. 10. So what does that mean? They've got 10. Spare. Good. Okay. Uh, yeah. Buffer. Another word is like spare stock. That's good. So, do you agree? In this company, they always keep ten items on hand. Yeah. Because they never know what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you the next question. When do they place an order? Um, at twenty. Good. Right. So when stock reaches twenty, i.e. How much, did I max, how much did I have in terms of maximum? 60 items. So I've got 60 items sitting in the storeroom. Am I going to be buying and selling those items? Yes. Okay, so now I'm selling those items. 60 goes to 58, goes to 50, goes to 40, goes to 30. When does the company place an order? As soon as the inventory hits 20. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Right, and how much buffer stock do they always keep on hand? 10. 10. Right, see, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, and that's very important because, remember, your exams aren't only going to be asking you to just repeat theory. They're also going to ask you to apply theory. So they could give you something like that where they give you information and then you need to interpret it. Right, so very important in terms of technique. So when you looked at this the first time, you were like, oh, what is that saying? Yeah. Okay, you're a, bit, you're a bit, like, worried about it. But now, don't stress about what is given. Um, best approach that I can give you is look at labels. Okay. All right, they have to give you labels. So there they have. Look at the X, look at the Y, and then just discuss what each of these levels look at. So here, maximum inventory, 60. What is that? Units. And time is like forever, weeks. So do you agree? It doesn't matter what time. It can be today, it can be next week, it can be at the end of the year. Yeah. How much stock do I always hold? 10. 60 units as a max. Well, 10 as a buffer. Okay, but yeah, that's, that's good. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Compare that to this company. Thoughts? They're all under the share. Exactly. See, in terms of inventory management, good company, good company. Which one? Fine. Good company. Why? Their inventory management is more consistent. Right, so I would rather want to work for this company because they're organized. Right, they know exactly when we're going to be placing orders for stock. Yeah. Right, when stock reaches 20, place an order. There's no question about it. There's no, oh, I'm going to think about it. It's, well, am I going to order or aren't I? Because that's how we manage our stock. Right, because if we don't buy more stock, what's going to happen to our sales? Decrease. It's going to be affected exactly. You see, because this business... Is all over the place, that's what you said. Yeah. Okay, so now this business isn't managing their stock. Mm -hmm. Why? There's no consistency here. There might be a little bit because it's kind of like up and down, up and down slightly. 
okay but as long as we still have enough stock so let me ask you this did this business ever have a problem with not having enough stock no. yes they did yeah when did they have a problem yeah yes very good see time number of cans okay yeah they're selling cold drink probably or something or yeah, soft drinks okay so we started how much did we start with 300. 300 it dropped to 125 it got to 50 and then we bought more in week one two three four five in week between week four and five we had a problem did this business have any problems no did their stock ever reach zero never they always had the buffer in place so that they would always have enough stock for their customers Okay, so have you ever had a situation where you go to a store and you want to buy something and they say, sorry, we're out of stock? Mm -hmm. So what did you do? You went to another store. So what happened to that store? They lost your business. Yeah. Okay, and you don't want that to happen if you're dealing with business. Okay, because yeah. this is how you manage your business. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Perfect. Okay, last heading, just in time. Yeah, it's just just in time. Just different considerations. Just in time. Yeah, it's the, it's the last topic. Uh, I think just in time you can probably fit there. Let's just have a look and see. Okay, you need the definition. You need one, two, three, four, five, six, seven bullets. Okay, and then you need an evaluation. Three bullets. Think you can fit that in. Okay, it's seven bullets here. I'll, I'll try to shorten this as much as I can. Um, and then you've got so you've got seven points here, mm -hmm. and you've got three points there. And then just a note here, see page 372, because we like these tables. Remember, these tables are very, 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 very useful. Yeah. Because they cover advantages, disadvantages, and they look at comparisons. Right, so whenever we've seen a table in the textbook, we've always made a note, go back and study it, or revise it, when looking at your exams. Is that okay? Yeah. Perfect. Definition. Easy. What do you think trust in time refers to? Just in time. Exactly. Meaning? Now. So how does it relate to inventory? Well, when dealing with inventory, what did we say has the most amount of cost? Let's go back. Uh, where was this? The where was it? Where's my holding stuff? Where are I write that now. Mm, oh, there's it. I want to highlight it. That bit. Okay, when we looked at storage, holding, lots of uh, lots of little costs, yeah. lots of different costs. Okay, remember. Okay, let me ask this: When we have an order cost, is an order cost an order cost? Yes. Okay, there's nothing really else. Do you agree? So, if you place an order, it's going to cost you maybe a rand to place an order for one unit, and it might cost you two rand for that unit to be delivered. Yeah. Okay, so if you're buying a hundred units is going to cost you two times a hundred. Okay, however much you're ordering, depending. But now with storage and holding costs, do I only have one cost? No. I've got space, I've got security, I've got refrigeration, and I've got insurance. Do you agree? Yeah. So now, uh, which costs are more? The ordering or the holding? The, the holding. The holding. Because you've got all of this that you need to consider. Yeah. So ideally, if you had to choose between reducing your order cost or reducing your holding cost, which one would you want to reduce? Well, um, holding, holding. Exactly. So what does trust in time do? Well, trust in time says, if I can place an order today and I can get the goods just in time before I need it, am I going to have to store it? Mm -hmm. No. Am I going to have to um, have security for it? No. Am I going to have to refrigerate it? No. So here's an example. Would uh, would would a retailer have to refrigerate the milk if 
the milk arrived exactly when the customers wanted to buy it. No. No, they wouldn't. It could literally come off the truck and go straight into the customer's basket. They buy it, they leave the store, no refrigerator is needed. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay, so that's what Trust in Time is doing. Trust in Time is using this as a cost that is big for businesses because can you imagine how much refrigeration they waste like the, the, the electricity, the time, the effort um, to keep those items cool. Mm -hmm. Now, if we didn't have all of that, it would make a big, big difference. And that's the definition. So trust in time. We're dealing with inventory. JIT eliminates the need for holding Inventory. JIT assumes that inventory arrives inventory arrives just in time. I.e. just before it's required. That's what you're looking at. And that's just in time. So now we need to look at the textbook. Uh, what did they say here? Okay, they've given the definition, that's fine. Okay, so if you're interested about the background, uh, who invented just in time? Uh, originating from Japan. So in Japan, they took this approach um, when looking at buffering inventory. So, do you want to have lots of buffer inventory? No. Storage costs. Right, so what they chose to do was components arrive just as they are needed on the production line. So that eliminates the need for buffer stock and that eliminates the, the need for storage and holding costs. The principle is easy to understand, but it is, it is less easy to implement into practice. Why do you say that? Why do they say that? Because not maybe the delivery won't be on time. Correct. Yeah, so um, obviously if delivery is done by human beings, mm -hmm. um, they might get stuck in traffic. And now what happens if they're late? Yeah. Or what happens if the driver's in an accident? Or etc, etc. Okay, there's so many variables to consider. Yeah. So in an ideal world, trust in time only works if you have a high level of um, trust in terms of the items arriving exactly when you need them. Okay, because you'll have to trust your suppliers so much because if those items don't arrive, your, your, your customers don't get the products. Yeah, makes sense. Okay. They've split this into seven different principles. JIT principles to be successfully introduced. Certain very important requirements of the business must ensure are met are. So, principles, number one, the first one is relationships with suppliers must be good. Good relationships with suppliers, let's just summarize it that way to help save space. Good relationships with suppliers. Number two. Production staff must be multi-skilled and prepared to change jobs at short notice. Right, so to summarize that in maybe two, three words, um, more skilled labor. Brackets, dealing with change. That's what they're describing there. Okay, obviously they explain that in more detail in the paragraph. They say, there is no point for a worker to continue to produce an item um, if the item hasn't, um, if the right item has um, uh, um, has been received, each worker must be able to switch to make a different um, item at a very short notice, and that no excess supplies um, of any one product are made. Okay, so meaning we work on what requires to be worked on, right? As and when we get the goods, we make those goods. Okay, so let's say we're let's say we're baking. I'm not okay. Baking's not a good example because you have to wait for the uh, oven to cook. Uh, let's use sewing. Okay, so let's say we're making clothing. 
Right, uh, if we're making clothing, when I get the material for the jeans, I make the jeans. When I get the material for the shirts, I make the shirts. Yeah. That type of thing. <coughs> okay. Number three, equipment and machinery must be flexible. Right, so flexible use of machinery, equipment. Let's use the word equipment because it covers machinery as well. So we don't have to write too much. Okay, what do we mean by flexible use of equipment? So now, if one item arrives, I should be able to do the knitting. If another arrives, I need to do the sewing. If another one, I need to do the um, printing, whatever the case is. Okay. Number four, accurate demand forecast. And that's okay at the customer. So accurate demand forecast. Demand relates to the customer. So if I know what the customer wants, can I produce those goods exactly when they want it? Yes, I can. I can create this item's trust in time before the customer actually needs it. And that can be very difficult to predict in some instances. Right, another topic, principles, um, IT equipment. IT equipment. They talk about computers, software, hardware, etc. They say, accurate data needs to be recorded and IT equipment must follow and track that the goods are received at the right time. Okay, so IT equipment is generally for, um, you can maybe say production line, perhaps, or tracking. Maybe just the word tracking is a good way to describe it. Number six. Excellent employees. Okay, so we're dealing with trust in time. We know this, we need those employees to be brilliant at what they do because now there's no time to sit and wait for stock, and there's no time to waste in terms of um, not being able to produce. Okay, because the other items are going to be arriving just in time. So when they come, as soon as those items come, they need to do something with those items. Does that make sense? Okay, because if they don't, if you don't have excellent employees, they're going to be sitting around and wondering, what do I do with the stock? Yeah. You can't have that mm -hmm. because then you're not dealing with just in time because then you're going to have storage and that's a problem. Right, and the last one, number seven, quality must be everyone's priority. So quality at all levels of production. So now we can't have flaws. So for example, um, we can't have stop and start. So let's say we're building a computer and the hard drive has a problem. Just in time will fail. Why? Because now you need to wait for another hard drive. Okay, because those items are coming just in time. Okay, so you can't wait now and say, ooh, this hard drive isn't working, we need a new one. Because that stops the whole just in time process. Okay. And then the last bit is just the chat and time evaluation, JIT evaluation. Um, I'm going to copy this slide, just put a different heading for this. Evaluation. There's only three points here. They said chat and time requires a very specific organizational culture. So it doesn't work in all countries. Okay, it works in Japan, doesn't work in others. Right, because um, it obviously, it's something that they've incorporated in their businesses. Okay, because they've, they've got a lot of what they described here. Okay, so that can, that can help them apply the system. What they do say here though is that the change in culture towards not accepting waste or purely used resources can be of great benefit to the benefit. This requires employees to be more accountable for their performance. So when is trust in time effective? Is when there's a high level of accountability. Right, so if they make a mistake, they make a mistake, own it, and then move on. Okay, so trust in time evaluation deals with that. Right, so how do we evaluate trust in time? Just could have put a note here, asterisk, um, just at the top here, next to evaluation, um, account accountability.
right? There must be a high level of accountability. People need to take ownership of their functions. Right? So if you're manufacturing the t-shirts, okay, you need to be doing the best possible job at that um, at that particular role. Okay, they say chapter time uh, may not be suitable for all firms at all times. Um, the first bullet that they talked about here in terms of the evaluation is there may be limits to the application of chapter time. There's the first thing. So evaluation, uh, limitations exist. Not all industries can incorporate just in time. It won't work in all instances. Number two, small firms could argue that the expensive IT systems uh, not, will not justify the benefits. Okay, there's your cost versus benefits. So evaluation, cost, cost could be higher. So a smaller company won't use just in time because they need to track every single item because it needs to come just in time. That's problematic. And then the last one, uh, in addition, rising global inflation, inflation makes holding inventory inventories of raw materials more beneficial because it may be cheaper to buy now instead of later. Okay, so another evaluation. Inflation is a consideration and a motivation for buying more today and holding it. Right, so we know that prices go up over time. That's economics. Yeah. So now it might make more sense just to buy more stock and just store it. Because buying now might save later. Because if we don't, when we do need it, the prices might have gone up. Mm -hmm. The example they used here is oil. Oil prices tend to go up. So if we're buying oil as when we need it, we might be buying it at a higher price. And that's bad. Okay. Another chapter completes.